My name is Mary Pallon. I'm the author of The Monopolist, which just came out in February. Um, I previously worked as a sports reporter at the New York Times, but before that wrote about money in Wall Street at the Wall Street Journal. So mostly now I write about business sports, kind of the intersection of it all. But I also, along the way, have learned a lot about board games, which is what I'm here to talk to you guys about today. So this is Monopoly. Now, most people are very familiar with the game. It's made by Parker Brothers, which in 1991 was acquired by Hasbro. This is the Monopoly board. You guys have probably all played on it. There's Mr. Monopoly, the iconic little mustachioed man with a monocle and a top hat. Um, the little red houses, green hotels. There are a lot of jokes in the game industry about um, Parker Brothers actually being one of the biggest um, home manufacturers, ha, ha, ha. Um, and the story for years was that the game was invented by this man, Charles Darrow, who during the darkest hours of the Great Depression, he was down on his luck, he was unemployed, and he goes into his basement and he creates Monopoly to remind his family of better times. He puts these Atlantic City properties on it because that is where they had vacationed. Uh, he sells the game to Parker Brothers. Here's a copy of his patent. If you look at it, it's from 1935. It looks a lot like the Monopoly game that we play today. In 2015, you can see the art is on there. Um, the properties, everything. A version of this story uh, about Darrow inventing the game and selling it to Parker Brothers uh, is still on you know, versions of Hasbro's website. Some people believe that Darrow himself was the inspiration for the Mr. Monopoly character, which you see up there. Uh, the only problem with that story is it's like not true. Um, the the Darrow Cinderella story, which is still told today often, um, actually it turns out Monopoly had a history long before it started with a woman in 1904. Um, this is Elizabeth J. McGee, or Lizzie McGee, as she's often known. She created a game that uh, was called the Landlord's Game, soon thereafter called the Monopoly Game by its early players in 1904, long before Parker Brothers, long before Darrow. So who was she? Uh, it turns out Lizzie McGee was a really interesting woman. Um, this is a copy of her a patent she had received in 1893 for this typewriter gadget. She was a stenographer. She was a writer. She was a poet. Uh, she had appeared in some theater productions. And then this news clipping I love, she was a really outspoken feminist. Uh, she had done this thing, it was around the turn of the century, she called it the slave girl stunt. And basically what she did is she put herself up for auction to the highest bidder as a protest against how women were paid at the time. Um, and she likened how women were treated to wage slavery. Uh, and it got a lot of attention you know, around the country. This is one of many news clippings. So one of the questions I had in researching her was, how did a woman like this come about? I mean, this is a century ago, and she's, she'd be pretty outspoken by today's standards, but certainly by then, you know, that times. So her father was James McGee. Now, James McGee was not just an influential newspaper owner of the time. He was around for the early days of the Republican Party. Uh, this is a picture of him. He had traveled with none other than Abraham Lincoln during the Lincoln-Douglas debates. Um, so he infuses a lot of these values into his daughter. Um, she, this is a template from one of her poetry books. And one of the things he passes on to his daughter is this book, Progress and Poverty by Henry George. So most people today don't know who Henry George was. Um, actually, some Georgists have shown up to some of the book events I've done, which has been really fun. Um, Henry George, just like, I'm not going to totally geek out on this, but he believed in single tax theory. And it's this idea that if we tax land and only land, the middle class has a better shot. And he, um, there are all these incredible news accounts of him packing out these halls as a public speaker. And he ran for mayor of New York City, actually, and came in second behind a Tammany Hall candidate, but ahead of this Teddy Roosevelt guy. So he wasn't some wingnut of his time period. I mean, people were really into him. And I kind of think of him politically as very much a reaction to um, the Carnegie's, the Rockefellers, this amount of wealth that was being created at the turn of the century that this country hadn't seen before. And there's a lot of questioning about how this should be distributed. Um, and it's really fun to read some of this stuff. You know, I read Progress and Poverty. and. Um, follow, and also the single taxers sometimes call themselves anti-monopolists. And uh, a lot of what they're talking about could be ripped from the headlines today about income inequality, wage distribution, things like that. So anyway, this is her patent for the landlord's game. She applies in 1903, she receives it in 1904. And you can see, if you look at it closely, there's some things that you'd recognize from a monopoly board. So she has go to jail on there. Um, she has public park. The Georgists were very concerned with public land and how it was used and natural resources. But obviously cars weren't as big of a deal in 1904. So hers does not have cars on it. So after she patents it, 
This game goes viral, but like turn of the century style, and it becomes a favorite among left-wing left -wing intellectuals, but especially in the Northeast. So a period of Rex Tugwell. Rex Tugwell was an uh, economist at Columbia. He later joined FDR's Brain Trust. He played the game. In the center, you have Ernest Angel, who was a national chairman for the ACLU. He had played it here in New York, I believe in the late 20s, early 30s. If there are any New Yorker fans or sports journalism fans, Roger Angel is his son. Um, Scott Nearing plays it, and Scott Nearing was involved in a very famous academic freedom case at Wharton. He plays it there, and he's also later in life considered to be one of the founders of the Green Movement. And it's played heavily in Arden, Delaware, which is this single tax colony. It was a big summer hangout for these people. The game was very popular, and one of the people who hung out in Arden, Delaware a lot was Upton Sinclair. And this is like a total tangent, but there's an amazing sex scandal involving Upton Sinclair at Arden, Delaware. And his cabin there was called the Jungalo, clearly an homage to the jungle. Yeah, so, so this was kind of like a freewheeling, I don't know if I'd call them hippies because it predates that, but um, kind of a freewheeling group of folks. So anyway, in 1924, Lizzie renews her patent for the game. And it's unclear how aware she was of how this game was being embraced and played. And people, they, when they made their own games, they would put, they would localize it. So there were New York games, there were Boston games, there were Philly games. And one group that really embraces it are the Quakers of Atlantic City. This is a picture of a Quaker Monopoly night, uh, which was very common at the time. And they make the board like Atlantic City because that's where they live, that's the community they know. And they make some key changes to Monopoly uh, to make it more like the game that we know today. So for example, they, in addition to the Atlantic City properties, they put fixed prices on the board. Uh, a realtor actually in Atlantic City does that. They also, uh, originally a monopoly in the landlord's game, there's a lot more auctioning with the game. So the, the noise of that bothers the Quakers. Silence is a tenet of their faith. So they decide, because they're playing with children, they want to make it simpler to get rid of that. So now, uh, you know, there's the fixed prices. What most people don't realize, how most people play Monopoly wrong is another conversation we can get into later. But usually when you land on a property, and if you don't want to purchase it, you, you put it up for auction. That's actually the rule. But there was a lot more of that. And then they also incorporate hotels. Um, around the Great Depression, Atlantic City, if anybody's watched Boardwalk Empire knows, it was kind of the place to be in the 20s. But during the Great Depression, a lot of these big hotels were vacant. And some of the Quaker teachers who were playing Monopoly were staying in these now vacant hotels. So they incorporate those into the game. So one of the players who plays the Atlantic City Quaker version of the, the game is Charles Todd. And this is a copy of the Charles Todd board. And as you look at this compared with the Landlord's game, you're noticing that it looks more and more and more like Monopoly today, has the Atlantic City properties, some of the colors are even the same. So Charles Todd plays this game and he runs into two old friends on the street, and um, the Darrows. And he had gone to school with Esther Darrow. And he, he and his wife, Olive, invite the Darrows over for dinner and a Monopoly night. They say, come over, it'll be great, we're, we're gonna play this game. So the Darrows and the Todds, they live in Philadelphia um, and they play this game and they have a great time. And Darrow asks Todd, hey, would you mind typing up the rules to the game for the game for me? And Todd thinks this is like a little strange because imagine if somebody asked you for like the rules for checkers or chess or something that had just been kind of around. But he does, his secretary does it nonetheless. And uh, Todd teaches Darrow the game. And let's cut to Parker Brothers for a minute. Um, Parker Brothers in the 1930s was a firm on the brink of destruction. It was a family owned firm that um, George Parker had started as a teenager in the 1800s, late 1800s, 1880s, if you want to be exact. And uh, he's now an old man. You can see him there sitting at his desk. And the balance sheet's a disaster. They need a hit. They need it quick. And his son-in-law, Barton, Robert Barton, who's second from the left there, had just taken over the firm. And uh, he was a lawyer by training. He had no game marketing experience, anything like that. So Barton, through his wife, uh, hears about this Monopoly game which Darrow is selling at Wanamaker's. This is a picture of Wanamaker's. Actually, if you go to Philadelphia, you can still go there. I think it's a Macy's. I'm not 110% sure. I'm getting some good nods. And um, side note on uh, Wanamaker's, that's actually where the film Mannequin was shot, which <laughs> I, I thought was amazing. Um, so, <laughs> so Darrow and Barton strike up this deal. They meet in the Flatiron Building, which is where the Parker showroom was. And this is a picture of Barton. He's, it's a terrible photo in terms of quality, but he's much older. In that image, and he just he buys Darrow's game for we believe seven thousand dollars plus residuals, and Monopoly becomes this blockbuster hit. And I can't really stress enough how no commercially sold game had sold like Monopoly had, let alone during the Great Depression. 
And the thinking in the game industry at the time was nobody's going to want to play a real estate game or a finance game. It's too complicated. It's too wonky. And they're certainly not going to want to play it at a time when nobody has either of those things. And the Darrow story becomes a big part of the marketing tale that this game actually came from an unemployed guy himself. He's just like you. And they use this to try and sell another game called Bulls and Bears. And that there's an image of that there. And game designers weren't really, even now, it wasn't like being the author of a book or the star of a film. These were people that weren't incorporated in marketing. And Darrow, I think of as kind of one of the first people to do that. And Parker can't make these sets fast enough. So they need tokens. Now, when the Quakers were playing and early folk players, they used you know, earrings, buttons, whatever was around. But Parker Brothers calls on Doust Manufacturing, which is this Chicago-based company that made Cracker Jack prizes. And the tokens, a lot of people have asked me about, like, what does the top hat mean? What does the dog mean? What is, you know? And the truth is, as far as we can tell, they were kind of an afterthought. These are some of the early tokens, and you can notice that some that have like a little loop. That's because Doust made them as charms often for charm bracelets and like little different tchotchkes. So some of them, the molds we believe were recycled. So for example, the, the iron, they had made tokens for a flat iron company in Chicago. And if you bought an iron, you'd get one of these too. So they were kind of an accident. But it's not long before Parker and Barton realized that they have a problem, which is that Darrow didn't actually invent the game. This thing was around for 30 years before. And they start hearing from people saying, you know, we, we had played this before. Um, and so Barton writes to, to Darrow and says, would you mind writing up a history of the game and your invention of it? And Darrow, in this letter exchanges in the book, um, kind of waffles. And he doesn't, he doesn't sign an affidavit saying he invented it. And he doesn't give a narrative or, you know, any, anything about Charles Todd or having learned the game before. And other people had tried to sell the game on, it, on their own before. So this is um, Dan Lehman's finance game. Dan Lehman had also played the game as a Quaker game. You can see that it's very similar. You have community chest, a lot of the properties. Um, and he had sold it. So Parker Brothers, once they realized that this game wasn't invented by Darrow, goes about acquiring all these other games. So there's finance. They meet with Dan Lehman. There's a game called Easy Money that Milton Bradley's making. They get this kind of bizarre licensing agreement there. A uh, gentleman in Texas had made a game called Inflation, and this game was out quite a bit. But the Darrow creation story perpetuated, and by now the train had left the station. It was everywhere. But Lizzie, she's pissed. So this is an interview from 1936. This would have been kind of at the height of the Monopoly craze, right after Darrow and the game were booming. So she, got, she gives this interview with Washington Evening Star. You can see her there. She's now an elderly woman with you know gray hair and a bun. She's holding up her boards and the Monopoly board, and if you read this, it says, but not for Miss Phillips, she'd gotten married by then, it is understood she received $500 for her patent, and she gets no royalties. Probably if one counts lawyers, printers, and patent office fees used up in developing it, the game has cost her more than she made from it. So in the end, it, the inventor probably got nothing, or according to this, maybe lost. So why did the patent office grant the Parker Darrow group its patent when McGee had two similar ones before it, we don't know. Um, usually when you go and research patent history, which is really geeky stuff, um, there's a thing called the patent wrapper, which is the information around a patent, a lot of documents, and the, um, the monopoly, the 1935 patent that I showed you, that patent wrapper has been missing for, I believe, at least 30 or 40 years. So as a researcher, you just hit this wall and you're like, ah, we'll never know. Um, so McGee and Darrow die. This is Darrow's obituary in the New York Times, hailing him as you know an all-American hero who had created this game. Lizzie McGee's obituary you have to look a lot harder for. Um, it's tiny. It makes absolutely no mention of Landlord's Game or Monopoly or anything like that. And for a long time, this was all lost to history. So how do we know any of this? We know this totally by accident. And it is because of this guy, Ralph Onspach. He was an economist living in Berkeley in the early 1970s. He was a teacher as well, and he made a game called Anti-Monopoly, which, as its name implies, is the opposite of Monopoly. And I think of it very much as an homage to the early 70s because it's, um, I don't even know how to describe it. Instead of getting total control of things, you're breaking them apart, and lawyers are the hero of the game. So it's very much like <laughs> an homage to like Nader's Raiders and like public interest law at a time when that was you know pretty hot. And Ralph was very concerned with the OPEC oil cartels and the monopolies of his, his time. And this was obviously a moment in American history of high cynicism. So it's not surprising that his game took off. And then these are some drawings, him and his two sons kind of 
create this game as a monopoly backwards and it takes off. There's actually a really great line in um, Patty Hearst's memoir where she buys her dad a copy of the game, which if you know anything about the Hearst family is juicy. So it's a countercultural hit. But he hears from Parker Brothers lawyers really quickly saying, you can't make anti-monopoly. Um, but this, instead of Ralph backing off, um, and it turns out that Parker Brothers at this time was reaching out to a lot of people making spin-off games. So like, there was a spaceopoly that, you know, was received basically a cease and desist. And also, I thought this was awesome. They sent, um, there was a priest making a game called Theopoly, who also heard from Parker Brothers and immediately backed down. But Ralph takes a different tack and he decides to fight it. And this kicks off a 10 year long legal battle over monopoly versus anti-monopoly. And in the process of researching his case, and as the case gets more attention, he starts to unravel the early history of the game. And he becomes a detective obsessed with telling the true story. And he starts to travel and track down as many of these early players, people who had played the game before 1935, as he possibly can. Now Lizzie McGee at this point is long dead, so he finds her patent, but he knows that his, a lot of his fate in court hinges on connecting the dots between that 1904 patent and the game that Parker Brothers put out in the mid-1930s. So he finds some of these original players. This is Dan Lehman, who had made finance, who's now a retired guy living in Pasadena. And he finds Charles Todd. He finds all these people and gets them to do sworn depositions. And this looks like notes from like organic chemistry, but it's actually Ralph's notes from trying to piece together some of these Quaker lineages and who is related to who, who is married to who, who had played the game. And, and a lot of these players, you have to remember this is like 30 years of history. So the Quakers, and this is them later testifying, you know, they're obviously older now. Um, they didn't know where the game had come from either because they had just played it. So by the time Todd and these other people were playing the game, they didn't know who Lizzie McGee was. They weren't friends with her. They didn't know it had kind of spread organically. So he has to reverse engineer the whole story. So one of the things that he talks to Charles Todd about is Marvin Gardens. Now remember, Charles Todd is not from Atlantic City. He's from Philadelphia. He just learned it from a friend who had played that version of the game. So if you go to Atlantic City, Marvin Gardens is spelt with an E-N because it's a combination of Margate and Ventnor. So that's on the Atlantic City board because the people in Atlantic City know how to spell the, you know, the neighborhood right. But Todd is not from there, so he makes an error. He spells it with an I-N. So that's Charles Todd's board, Marvin Gardens. Oops, he made a spelling error. He's a Philadelphia guy. Now, one of the key things in copycat cases that lawyers and courts look at is whether you copy an error, because what are the odds that you're gonna make the exact same error twice? So the Darrow board has Marvin with an I-N. Da, da, da. And, uh, and Charles Todd later jokes that he believes this is one of the most repeated spelling errors in history, because every Monopoly board from 1935 on has his spelling error. One of the other things that comes up in the on-spot case are the color groupings. Um, and this is an earlier Monopoly board. Actually, um, this was in really beautiful shape and a collector had emailed me this photo. Um, he had found it in his attic, which one of the great things, by the way, about the book coming out has been even after the on-spot case, like we, here we are a hundred years later, people are still finding these things and now understand like where they're coming from. Um, but you can see it definitely has color groupings and it says Monopoly just clean across the top. So the idea that people weren't calling it Monopoly, I mean, this comes up in the depositions, but they were calling it that a lot of the distinctive fe features were there. So Ralph starts talking publicly about this history and he starts referring it to as the Monopoly lie, and this corporate scandal and that Parker Brothers had erased this woman from history. And he's very vocal about this, even though the litigation is going on. And he learns about this Atlantic City Monopoly tournament that's going on and they're giving out the Darrow Cup and he sees, he thinks this is outrageous because Darrow didn't originate the game. So he decides he's gonna sabotage the tournament. And this is an ad he takes out. He's gonna have a Truth About Monopoly lecture next to where a lot of the press that was covering the Monopoly tournament was staying. So unfortunately, Parker Brothers catches wind of this event because he had been advertising it after all, and they rearrange the schedule so basically nobody comes. But you wouldn't know by looking at this photograph, Ralph looks pretty excited. But he's undeterred. There's actually a bigger tournament taking place in Washington, D.C. soon thereafter. Now, because his case had gotten a lot of attention, he heard from these two college kids at Cornell who were part of the Ivy League Monopoly Association, which was an unsanctioned tournament. And they'd also published a How to Win at Monopoly book that had rattled, you know, rattled a lot of people at Parker Brothers. So these college kids reach out to Ralph and say, you know, we're in it to win it. We're with you on this crusade. We're going to sabotage this D.C. Monopoly tournament with you. So what they do is they go to DC and they slip like truth about Monopoly pamphlets under people's dinner plates, um, especially the journalists. So that you know they they're successful and like everybody starts laughing. It's great. So one of those college kids is Jay Walker, 
the billionaire founder of Priceline.com. <laughs> and when Ralph originally told me this story, I thought, that's, you know, Jay Walker, such an ambiguous name. So of course I had to like contact him and be like, hey, I'm fact checking a story for the Wall Street Journal. Did you like sabotage a Monopoly tournament <laughs> when you were in college? And Jay was like, oh yeah, how's Ralph? Send him my best. And it totally checked out. I was like, that's insane. And then the other author of this book, you can see Jay, I did some serious like Amazon and eBay squatting and finally got a copy, um, is Jeff Lehman. So Jeff Lehman was his roommate at Cornell who ended up becoming the president of Cornell and um, actually came to an event I did. So on the book tour, people that are in the story keep showing up, so it's kind of great. So when I did this presentation at NYU, I was like, that guy sabotaged the tournament. So anyway, <laughs> meanwhile in court, Parker Brothers wins an injunction and normally when you win an injunction, you take whatever merchandise you're arguing about and you like throw it you know, in a warehouse or something. But Parker Brothers is so confident they're gonna win, they decide to stage a burial of Ralph's 40,000 anti-monopoly games. And they invite journalists, like people covered this. This is a photo of those games being buried in Minnesota. And at this point, Ralph, uh, you know, this battle's been going on for years. His personal relationships are really frayed. He's gone through several lawyers Litigation wasn't cheap then, um, as obviously as it now, so his finances, I think he had taken out maybe two, if not three mortgages at this point. Um, he's at his wit's end. And he thinks he's winning, actually, but Parker Brothers decides to appeal to the Supreme Court. This is not good. Ralph's lawyer at this point was a guy named Carl Pearson, one-man legal shop, basically, and the two of them were working round the clock, and the amicus briefs in this case are really fun to read because it's like a who's who of corporate America, and the argument was basically that if you allow I'm really, really paraphrasing here, but that the trademark law as we know it will collapse if you let anti-monopoly win. But the Supreme Court refuses to hear the case and Ralph wins. And he not only wins his right to make anti-monopoly, but he wins his right to talk about the history and the origins openly. And the court upholds his research and that the game actually originated with Lizzie McGee and these Quaker players. Um, however, victory is not enough for Ralph and he decides he wants to go dig up his games. Um, there's 40,000 of them, they're in Minnesota, they're his. And after all, he's won the case, the Supreme Court has put the final word on it. So he and his friend Russ Foster, this is a really poorly, poor quality photo of them, they go to try and dig and they look and they look and they look and they can't find them. They're really frustrated, they pack it in. Then a friend contacts him and says, so you're digging in the wrong spot. And Ralph says, oh, we'll, we'll go back, we'll find them. And they said, well, you can't really do that because they started building condos on top of where they were buried. <laughs> so when sometimes people ask me, like, why have you spent five years researching Monopoly, which is a perfectly legitimate question, I feel like sometimes if, if we don't, some, these games are gonna get found, right? Like, whether that's a year from now or 10 years or 10,000 years from now, and we need a document or something explaining like why they got there, how they got there, like, and, and as far as I know, they're still there. So there you have it. And um, <laughs> so I follow Monopoly iconography a lot. And one of the things that's amazing to me is that the game is still everywhere. It's a meme, which makes me happy. It's on Gossip Girl, Jon Stewart's a fan. Um, and I put this tattoo up there only because I want to find this person. And I feel like if you have an arm sleeve of Monopoly stuff, you're going to show up to like some Monopoly related book event. If anybody has any intelligence, please let me know. <laughs> I really, I'm, I'm just curious. I want to know everything about it. Um, so that's, um, this is my book, and you can buy millions of copies of it. And I feel like, you know, just to go back to this, like, why obsessively research games piece, I think that for me, I mean, this was like a fact-checking question gone awry. I, like everybody, thought Monopoly had inv was invented during the Great Depression. And in researching it, it's taught me a lot about how things are actually made. I think that you know we love the light bulb story, we love the Darrow story because it's so romantic. Like who doesn't want to believe that that could happen to any of us? But the truth is that making things, whether it's a game or I mean, I'm sure you guys go through this here all the time. Um, it's really complicated and messy and collaborative, and it takes trial and error. And that's the story of Monopoly. So I'm happy to take any questions you may have. Ooh, so one of the things that's been so fun about this has been the book has brought like a lot of like conspiracy theorists out and so some people have offered up theories. Based on my reporting, I have none. Like I have no clue and obviously because the property became so lucrative, there's a ton of incentive um, to, to get rid of stuff. But also like with historical research, one of the things that blows me away is that any of the stuff survives at all. 
I mean, especially like Lizzie McGee and some of those documents. So people like just lost stuff all the time. So I have no idea. I mean, I love the like idea of like a sinister backstory, but the truth is it could have been some janitor, you know, like I, so, so I have no idea. Um, but that's a great question. Do you? I mean, what do you know? <laughs> in the 30s, it's Parker Brothers, you know, any number of sketchy stuff could have happened, especially considering right. that you had a bunch of like lefties at the time championing it, so. Right, right, absolutely. Yes? So what is the state of competitive monopoly now? Are there big tournaments going on? So that's a great question. Um, one of my favorite books is Word Freak by Seven Facets, which if you haven't read, it's great. It's about competitive Scrabble playing. And I think because of the nature of Monopoly as a game, it doesn't have the same competitive circuit. Like Hasbro every now and then will sponsor a tournament. I think there's one in Macau this fall, but it's very you know all over the place. It's not like it happens every year. And if you really want to geek out on the game design, I think that Monopoly, it's not designed to be as great of a strategic game. Like you can't study up for it the same way you can Scrabble. So there really hasn't been much of a competitive circuit. Um, and I think that's okay. I mean, some of these people think I'm like this Monopoly purist and a nut. And I'm like, no, like Settlers of Catan is a great game. I mean, but like Monopoly was like, you know, from a century ago. I kind of think of it when I, when I did this event, the Game Design Center, all these game designers were like, it sucks. And I was like, it's like a Model T. Like, it's okay that it's not, a, you know, a perfect game today. It's, it was a great stepping off point for all these other great ones. So. Um, yeah, and I mean, one of the problems with it too is it's a very lopsided game. So unless you're playing with people who actually follow the rules and kind of have a similar skill set, like the deal making and the stuff that makes it fun kind of falls flat. But yeah, there's tournaments, meh, you know. Sorry if that was a disappointing answer. My dad is actually the Monopoly champion of Pennsylvania. Woo, yeah. <laughs> Guys, we have royalty in the room, who yeah. knew? Um, but his family grew up playing Monopoly and they're super competitive in like right. they all play together and like I just get destroyed every single time. Okay. Right, right. Um, but Absolutely. he actually went, they had like a tournament in New York um, after he won the whatever Pennsylvania championship. Um, and then he lost at the at the um, I guess state or like US wide tournament. But it's still going on. <laughs> That's awesome. And there's some like unsanctioned tournaments yeah. too and the, the dark underbelly of competitive <laughs> monopoly playing. Yes. Modern war games was Monopoly very unprecedented at the time, or was there already a large collection of other similar things that people were playing with, like dice on boards that like weren't checkers or chess? Absolutely. So uh, there's a lot more about that in the book and kind of the history of Parker Brothers and Milton Bradley because I felt like I needed a lot of context even walking up to Lizzie McGee's game. So when you look at her patent, there were a lot of things there that I hadn't seen before. So like the circular game design. Um, what wasn't unique about hers is that games at the time were often used for teaching. They were often used as a means of communication, just like you would write an article about something political you were fired up about or what have you. What was strange about Monopoly is that it really, as a commercial game, was a huge blockbuster. And it opened the door for all these other financial and real estate games and things. But it, um, there hadn't really been a game that had sold quite at that level and kind of popped through. And games that were commercial hits were rare enough, but Monopoly was kind of one of the first marketed games that is a perennial. I mean, here we are sitting around talking about it. And nobody had really gotten rich off of a game like Darrow had. So it kind of created this, you know, following after um, Darrow, Darrow sold the game, Parker Brothers started getting all these pitches from people wanting to become the next Darrow. And I think that was from a marketing perspective, something that hadn't really happened before. But the history of games leading up to this point is like worthy of a second book. Um, and there's some of the bibliography that if you really want to go in the weeds on that might be useful. I'd be happy to point them to you. Point them out to you. Yes. So people publish uh, entirely alternate rule sets for Monopoly. They just throw right. out most of the concepts of the game, but you still use the board, you still use the pieces. Uh, do you have a favorite alternate rule set of that sort? So this group of, um, I, I, I get really great emails from people about this. And this was maybe a year or two ago. Somebody had emailed me and they created a version of the game with securitization. <laughs> so, so you're like, you're selling properties, but you're bundling, like you're bundling mortgages and stuff. And I thought it was like kind of a fascinating, great idea. And like, so the idea, you clearly have to play with a group of players that are into that, but I thought that was like very, very funny. Um, and it was the first time I even thought of securitizing <laughs> mortgages and stuff and on the Monopoly board. Yes. In that regard, what do you think of uh, like the new version of Monopoly with credit cards and, and like the amounts and like the millions of dollars? Sure. So I did a piece for the Sunday Review at the Times about this. Um, 
you know, like as a purist, I think it's like a little silly, but I also think that it's a little hypocritical of me to be like, you can't put credit cards in Monopoly because if you look at the origins of the game, it was all about people making it their own. So it's just another iteration of it. And one of the things I find really strange about that is I, a parent came up to me at an event I did and was like, oh, we use Monopoly to teach our kids about money. And I was like, oh, I guess my parents did too. And she was like, no, you don't understand because of credit cards, they don't see me use money. Like they don't understand $5 versus 10 versus 20. And I was like, oh, whoa. So like if you do the credit card version of the game, you, you, you lose that financial lesson. Um, so, so I, I mean, I don't own it. I'm not like, I'm also not a game collector. I mean, I live in New York City. I don't have time for that or space. Um, so, so I guess I'm kind of meh about it to summarize it. I didn't write that in the Sunday review. Like Mary's meh about it, leave the rest of the space. Um, so yeah. Any other questions, comments, concerns, thought of your day? So yes. can we all start selling our own derivatives of the game Monopoly? So that's a very juicy question. <laughs> um, so there's a collector in Portland. Uh, he, his website's landlordsgame.info, and he's going to start making landlords games. Um, and I'm not a lawyer, but my understanding is that Hasbro controls the brand, like the Monopoly brand, and then all those spin-off games USAopoly makes with a license through Hasbro. So um, again, with my non-legal hat, my guess is you probably could, but wouldn't be surprising. I mean, do you want to fight a 10 year long legal battle like Ralph? I mean, I don't know, you know, but the, he did win. There's, there's you know? precedent now, right? So. Right, well also, and this is in the book too, and I didn't include it here, but after his case, um, the trademark lobby uh, approached Congress and they rewrote trademark law. And they tucked it into, I think it was the Semiconductor Chip Act. And it's actually called, so Ralph's lawyer at the time had to reach out to, I think Orrin Hatch sponsored the amendment, but had to reach out to whoever his representative was at the time. And they, there's actually like an anti-monopoly amendment, which is insane. So like this case, there's like a hole in this new batch of trademark law, which is why I'm a little hesitant to say it, because if you were to fight Ralph's case today, it'd be a different legal thing because trademark and patent law has changed so much, partially as a result of this case. So, yeah. Yes? So, Monopoly seems to be very centered in American culture, and I'm wondering if you've seen interesting international versions of the game? Absolutely. So, the first country that I'm aware of outside of the US where it was played was in London, uh, or excuse me, in the UK, and Waddington's controlled the license. So, what's weird is that if you go to different parts of the world, they made, so if you, go to, if you buy a French version of the game, it's going to have Paris properties. If you go to London, it's going to have, you know, Piccadilly Circus and all this other stuff on it. So um, yeah, they're, they're huge. And somebody told me in Brazil, they even have like Sao Paulo and Rio versions. So those are really popular, they're everywhere. Um, and actually this is really getting back in the history, but um, board games, um, they're, they're interesting to me politically because there's all sorts of chatter about whether they were allowed, you know, across the wall, was Monopoly allowed, it's a symbol of capitalism, and the history is a little murky. But one thing I did find in my research is that Adolf Hitler used board games a lot with Hitler Youth. <laughs> and um, there are these really insane games, like there's one called Jude and Rouse, and it's about, which means Jews out. And like seeing like really insane like propaganda on board games was like, wow, like people really understood the power of these as tools and teaching tools. And so, so, you know, there were Monopoly spinoffs and all sorts, of, like, because this game was so successful, a lot of people, good and evil, started making them worldwide and all these bizarre different flavors. So, yeah. Yes. I remember reading somewhere that the game mechanics of Monopoly are purposefully terrible to t essentially teach that Monopoly, like the real life concept is not fun because one person ends up with everything and everybody else is just kind of crushed beneath the machine of capitalism. Right. Is there any truth to that? So what's funny about that is that when Lizzie McGee made her 1904 game, she made two rule sets. She made a monopolist rule set and an anti-monopolist rule set. And the monopolist rule set is the one that takes off. So you can read into human nature whatever you want on that, that we like chose like the, the evil one where we have to crush everybody. Um, so I think you could make an argument, right? Like she was, like her politics were clear. Like she did not think that, you know, her view of capitalism was not that one person should control everything you have to destroy everybody else. So you could make this argument that the monopolist rule set, you know, and its origins was to teach people about how awful it feels to lose at Monopoly, which we've all been there. Um, so I don't think that's off base. Son is super into Monopoly. He has like the Batman Monopoly, the Yankees Monopoly. Do you have a favorite 
alternative? Your son has good taste. Um, yeah. Let me think about that. Um, have you seen all the, pardon? I've seen, I'm sure you've seen all the variations of this stuff. I've seen a lot of them. It's kind of impossible to see them all. I like, um, I like them all, but you know, I actually, this is going to sound really geeky, but recently, through a game designer, I was able to play the Quaker version right before the auctions were added. So if you play Monopoly where you land on every, pro you could probably do it with your set at home, where every time you land on a property, you auction it, it changes the entire game. And it's a total, but it, but it changes it in a way that I think is kind of fun if you're used to playing the game. So I think like the pre-Parker Brothers auction Monopoly is like my new favorite. In terms of the commercially sold one, I grew up in Eugene, Oregon, so Duckopoly was a family default if we didn't play like the traditional, so. Which is hyper local, because Eugene is not a big place. It's like, oh, that's our street, um, which was always fun. Yes? Did you have any interactions with the Parker Brothers? So, yes. Um, I contacted them several times, sent them hundreds of fact-checking questions. Um, when the excerpt ran in the Times a few weeks ago, I contacted them again. They have not, like, offered anybody up for interviews, no comment, anything like that, which isn't the first time a journalist has received a no. Um, although they acquired the company in the early 90s, so the bulk of this story took place before then. And I was able to, because of this court case, I had a lot of documents. So whenever possible, like Barton, his, you know, his deposition's a whole sequence in the book, I tried to give voice, because I was really interested in the history of this company, and I was really interested in the decisions they made. And I think it's really easy to write a story that's black and white, but actually this one had a lot of gray. Um, and I was able to talk to a lot of former executives and former people and, you know, people in the family are related to it. So I feel like I was still able to get, a, I tried my darndest to get as full of a picture as I could. Um, but yeah, it's always a bummer when somebody doesn't want to talk to you, so. Yep. Any other questions? I think I've heard every Monopoly related question at this point. <laughs> I've heard every Monopoly pun, I, you know. Yes, I've passed, go, you know, all that. Yeah. What's your strategy when you play Monopoly? Do you have a strategy? Oh. So the Jay Walker book that I mentioned is actually, if you want like a pure strategy book, pretty great. Um, I'm a big believer of the strip between jail and free parking, because it gets landed on more. And the ROI, if you're building, is pretty great. And I'm a big advocate of housing sh shortages. So what most people don't realize is that the number of houses and hotels in any game is fixed. So what I do is I become like a total slumlord and I'll like, I, I, don't, I don't think I've bought a hotel in Monopoly in like years, it's just like not interesting. And it totally screws people and they don't realize it until it's too late. So that's, that's I, I don't think I've purchased free parking or North Carolina Avenue or any of the greens or any of those in a long time either. Unless you're trying to like thwart a competitor, but there you have it. Too expensive to build, not interested. <laughs> <laughs> right. No, but most people like, who here has actually ever read the Monopoly rules? Okay, this is a smart room. Um, <laughs> because like my, and my family, people will argue with me about it. I'm like, right, dad, what do I know about Monopoly? You know? <laughs> You're right, we should put everything in free parking. No, you know, still a source of, still a raw nerve. Um, <laughs> yes? You met Ralph first. Yeah, I spent a lot of time interviewing him. How is he? Ralph is really funny. You know, he's 89, and actually I just emailed him a few weeks ago about something, and he said something amazing which is life begins at 89. And I was like, <laughs> wow, that's an amazing insight. Because like, poor Ralph, like I started interviewing him five years ago. And he, I, as far as I know, this is the first journalistic account of the whole history. So to wait 40 years, right, for a journalist to come along, you know, or 30, 40 years or whatever, like that's a long time to wait. And um, he's very, um, and I interviewed his sons and his ex-wife who actually passed away while I was reporting. Um, she was really helpful. So I kind of got this portrait of him, not just from spending time with him, but also his family. He's very professorial. And the fact that this story fell in the hands of somebody who had a PhD in economics was, I think, one of the great things that happened. Because he basically became a paralegal and understood the inner workings of this case and the history and the politics of it in a way that had it been somebody who just made a board game or something, I don't think it would have you know, been, the story wouldn't have been as fleshed out. Um, but he's very academic, very even-tempered, um, very, one of the things I struggled with a lot in writing it is I kept asking myself numerous, he turned down a massive settlement offer and there's a lot more drama in the book about, you know, what it took for him to win this case and I thought, God, like, me and most people I know would have called it quits, you know, there's so, and also we knew the outcome, you know, when you're doing historical research, you're looking at it 
like knowing that he'd already won. And he obviously didn't because this was happening in real time and he had so many odds against him. And I was like, why did he fight this? And his background is that he was born in Danzig, Jewish family, fled to the States. Had he stayed any longer, he probably would have died. And then was an immigrant in the United States and had this. So understanding kind of his history as a fighter, or as somebody who had to like, you know, battle to survive, understood, it made me understand why he was, you know, in the Bay Area also protesting against the Vietnam War. And um, I think one of his sons told me that he would go to these marches with like a helmet, you know, like it, it takes a certain kind of personality. And it took me a long time to kind of reconcile this like gentle old man with his like, you know, sweaters and mismatched shirts with that. And I think that that's like a challenge that you, that you have in more historical reporting that you don't in journalism. When you report like a daily story, the person's right there and you're watching them do the thing that is putting them in the news. And with this, I had to wind back the clock a lot more because he had evolved a lot as a result of this too, even from the start of the case to the end. So, any other questions? Yes. We all know how most of the house rules make the game way worse, but how do you write something house rules that make it way better? Um, the one that comes to mind just off the top of my head is playing it timed, um, just because it kind of incentivizes people, kind of like you would with like chess. Um, yeah, my family won't do it that way, but, <laughs> um, but, but that seems like a fun way. And also there's ways you can start with um, handing out people's properties. So you just start where everybody, you just like, you know, it makes the game go faster too, but you just have to work with what you're handed, basically. So it's kind of like Clue, where you hand out the, you know, you have whatever evidence you have in the beginning. So that's another one that I think is fun. It's good with kids too. Yes, anything else? I was so nervous. I was like, God, everybody at Google's so smart. And somebody at Bloomsbury was like, you know a lot about Monopoly. Like, it's going to be OK. It's <laughs> like, they could probably have a Monopoly division at Google. We wouldn't even know. <laughs> they could be making the sets downstairs. We can't make any assumptions. Um, any other questions? Great. Thank you so much. And if you have any questions, email me. That's not a dummy Gmail. I actually use it. <laughs> <laughs>